them by. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Stay with me. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hold your light. Hold. Come on and hold it high. You know that somebody's lost, lost in the harbor. You can't hold it low, hold it low. You got to hold it. Somebody's lost. And at this time, I want you to raise your voices as loud as you can with that song. Hold it, hold your light. Hold it high. Why don't you grab somebody's hand? Somebody's lost. Let me see your light. In the harbor, you can't hold it low. You got to hold it high. Somebody's lost in the storm. One more time. Let's sing this from our souls. Hold your light. And there's a language that we all speak. It goes like this. on this little light of mine. Keep it right there. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light I'm gonna let it shine let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You sound beautiful, beautiful. Good evening to you all. God, we ask your grace and mercy to be with us as we seek to live lives of truth and justice and love. Grant us the power of your spirit, always. For we ask it in the name of that which is divine in this universe, amen. amen. I'm honored to be here tonight. I want to first thank the pastor of this church, the Reverend Roger Ginch, for allowing us to come and the congregation here and I want to recognize that this is the church certainly where Abraham Lincoln worshiped, but also where 
the Poor People's Campaign, part of it was housed right here in this church and people were in the sanctuary during those days. I want to honor Liz Theo Harris, the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign who could not be with us tonight taking care of members of her family. I want to thank our brother Great Reverend Grayland for all of his work and my good sister Phyllis Bennis uh, for which all of this would not be possible for Ross Pellis, for all of the organizers who continue to work and continue to build as we go, move toward the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival that begins on next, month, on next week on Mother's Day. And I want to certainly thank the National Council of Churches, the Institute for Policy Studies, the National Iranian American Council, Code Pink, Peace Action, U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, Veterans for Peace, Win Without War, Jobs for, with, with Justice, and the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and others who have been so supportive in us having this night uh, to come together. I want tonight to talk about in the face of the war economy and militarism, nonviolent dissent, nonviolent moral dissent, nonviolent moral resistance, and nonviolent moral visions are a necessity today just as they were in yesteryear. I come here tonight to speak and yes, even to preach on a subject that cannot be ignored if we are truly concerned about a more perfect union and the establishment of justice. It cannot be ignored if we are concerned about moral injury and the deepest moral foundations of faith that call us to embrace and pr prophetically imagine and promote an agenda of love, truth, justice, care for the immigrant and the poor and the least of these. I come not tonight to speak on a subject that cannot be ignored if we truly are con truly concerned about this democracy and the world a subject so important that Martin Luther King taught, and we know that if every decision is shaped by a nation's commitment to a philosophy and ideology that pri privileges militarism, that nation sows its own demise. Dr. King stood courageously and said, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. He was right then, and 50 years later, it is still true. I come to address tonight what General Eisenhower, a retired five-star Army general, the man who led the Allies on D-Day, said when he made his remarks in his farewell speech in 1961. He said to us, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. And originally, that statement was the congressional military-industrial complex. He said then, the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. And we must remember that today. I come tonight to address what we must address. And that is how the war economy and milita militarism connect to what we in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, call five interlocking injustices. Brother Grayland's systemic racism as seen through voter suppression, immigrant injustice, the continuing legacy and oppression of indigenous First Nation Indian nations, Islamophobia and xenophobia, systemic poverty of over 140 million poor and low wealth citizens, ecological devastation, and our distorted moral narrative. If you're going to address the other four, you have to address the issue of the war economy and militarism. Now tonight, I also come as a pastor 
a pastor 25 years of a church in a military-based town. I have to soothe and console the members of my church and community when they or their loved ones go off to war and when they have deep questions about why. I pastor people who've been affected by every war since World War II. I've had to bury family members who came back in flag-draped caskets from the war. I must minister to those among the hundreds of thou thousands who come back alive but scarred mentally and physically from war, even in my own family members and church members. I am the son of a World War II Navy veteran who was drafted as a college student at Elizabeth City State University into a segregated Navy, asked to go and fight for the world's safety against Hitler, and, had to yet, had, and yet had to suffer because of white supremacy in America, the indignity of having to ride in the back of the train while German war veterans rode in the front. I am the grandson of a man who was a World War I veteran who served in the military and was among those threatened when they came back home in a land where black men were being hung on an average of one per day in the early 1900s. And black soldiers faced riots of white supremacists who sought to put them in their place. And yet I come with no hatreds towards this country, but with a prayerful commitment to be among those who love her enough to be the real kind of patriots that dare to tell her the truth and to join with others who would tell the truth. I don't come proposing to know everything or I don't come naive enough to think that we do not have dangers in the world. But I do come tonight from all of those different directions and even remembering the words of my father who was in war, who still knew that war is not the answer. And I come knowing, as Marvin Gaye once sang years ago, we must still ask today, as the United States spends more and more on war and militarism, what's going on? What's going on? And especially now, as we have a president fueled by narcissism as a commander and the hounds of war lining up and filling up the top advisory roles, who just a few days ago dropped illegal bombs on Syria that in no way met the standards laid down in the Joint War Powers Resolution. The first question is not even about the wrongness or in Syria, but the the War Powers Resolution that was designed to interpret the purpose of, of, of our Constitution and to ensure that the collective judgment of both the Congress and the President will apply to the introduction of United States Armed Forces into hostilities. It is in that place, it is in that place that it says that the constitutional powers of the Commander-in-Chief to in introduce the United States Armed Forces into hostilities or into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by circumstance are exercised only pursuant to, one, <clears throat> a declaration of war, two, specific statutory authorization, and three, a national emergency created by attack upon the United States, its territories or possessions or its armed forces. This means that the President can order troops without a congressional declaration and without an authorization for the use of military force only if there is an attack on U.S. territory, on U.S. troops, or on U.S. territories or possessions, which mean the other day we dropped illegal bombs. And we can never surrender this power to one man. We must declare that moral dissent, moral resistance, and moral vision cannot in any way dismiss the violence of any country or leader and must challenge the war economy and militarism here in America. Because as we sit here tonight, there are enough nuclear weapons in the world to destroy life on Earth between five to 50 times. So many that they can't agree 
But the bottom line is the world's nuclear arsenal and our own are so powerful that we could destroy the earth many times over. The U.S. spent more on military than the next seven countries combined. And those were China, Saudi Arabia, Rus Russian Federation, India, France, the UK, and Japan. We spent nearly three times as much as China and nine times as much as Russia. Our military spending was 26% of the world's total. United States, now there are around 800 or more bases in foreign countries, 70 years after World War II and 62 years after the Korean War. We must know if this is left unchecked and unchallenged and uncritiqued, America, as Dr. King once said, has been and still has the potential to be the greatest purveyor of violence the world has ever known. The Bible says in Mark chapter 5 that Jesus arrived on the other side of the country of Gadarenes. He got out of the boat. He met a madman from the cemetery that came upon him. He couldn't be chained. He couldn't be tied down. He had been tied up many times with many chains, night and day. He rolled through the lowlands of the graves and the hills. Jesus saw him a ways off. He ran to pray before Jesus, asked Jesus what business did, he, the son, did Jesus have with him. And he said, I don't want you to give me a hard time. And Jesus did something interesting. He asked him, tell me your name. The man replied, my name is Legion. And then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish him from the country. A large herd of pigs were browsing and rooting on a nearby hill. The demons begged them, send us into the pigs so we can live. Jesus gave the order, but then the pigs ran off the side of the hill. Everyone came out to see what had happened. And they came up to Jesus and saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothing, no longer in the graveyard, but up higher. And those who saw it told others. And then at first they were in awe, but then suddenly they were upset. They were more upset over losing their money than they were this man being healed. And they demanded that Jesus go and never come back again. You need to know that this text is about the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire. It was a place that was set up by many veterans of the Roman army. Veterans that conquered lands as payment for their service. This story in the Bible is about confronting imperial material, militarism. Mark's description of this demonic pain is detailed and is poignant. We, sh we should be mindful that this sort of agony has long captured the imagination of artists and poets as well as psychologists and political reformers describing the condition of human oppression. And Mark clearly characterizes this man as a victim. He's a victim of militarism. He's a victim of military occupation. For he says, my name is Legion. Legion, for we are many. And that Latin term had only one meaning, a division of Roman soldiers. Four such legions were based in Syria to control, at that time, the eastern frontier, including Jewish Palestine. And we understand, need to understand that this text is trying to say to us that an overcommitment to militarism and war will literally drive us down into the graveyard of life. It is trying to say that the whole complex, demonic structural complex of militarism can create a situation where we no longer know our names or our purpose, but every decision is driven by military might and the war economy rather than what is right and instead of and what should be done. We must wrestle with how historically the legions have come down, have down through the years, have held us as a nation in the low places. 50 years ago, the U.S. was mired in a brutal, unwinnable war thousands of miles away. The war in Vietnam was a classic rich man's war fought by and between poor people, mostly poor American soldiers backed by poor South Vietnamese troops fighting against even more poorer South Vietnamese nationalist guerrillas and North Vietnamese troops. The poor people who met in the muddy tents of Washington, D.C.'s Resurrection City in the summer of 1968 were the people whose sons and fathers, uncles and brothers, 
had been drafted and sent to fight in the jungles of Vietnam. So focusing on militarism as a key component of what the Poor People's Campaign was all about was new to some in that movement, but not all. Militarism was a new target for some. Challenging militarism as a necessary component of a moral revival in our nation was new to some in that first movement, but not all. There was a legal draft then that made all young men theoretically vulnerable to being dragged, drafted, willingly or not, into the military. The draft made the military somewhat more democratic. All young men had to register to vote, had, by, had to register, excuse me, by their 18th birthday. All knew they might be sent to Vietnam. But that draft didn't, in fact, affect everybody the same. The wealthier boys and those tracked into high achievement high school classes look forward to college deferments, which if they planned it right, could keep them out of the military altogether. That was where race and racism came in and poverty, because the young men who weren't wealthy and didn't get tracked into college prep courses were disproportionately black and Latino and many were poor whites. So they were the ones who were disproportionately drafted, disproportionately served in the frontline combat units, and were disproportionately killed. The war in Vietnam reflected the militarism that had infected our whole society in the context of the Cold War. We were told Vietnam was a domino, and if it fell, all of Southeast Asia would fall next, and soon the communists would be invading San Diego. Only war could protect us from such a fate, and if it meant 58,000 young American troops had to die, and if two million of, or more Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Latinos had to be killed, that was just the price of freedom. We didn't hear much about the origins of the war in Vietnam. And I don't mean only the specific origin, the so-called you know, Gulf Resolution authorizing troops to be deployed to Vietnam, which we now know was based on lies. I'm talking about the broader origin, that Vietnam was fighting a war against French colonialism. And when the French were finally defeated, our government agreed to take up the military fight to protect the pro-Western proxy government in South Vietnam. We didn't hear much about that. But Mother Coretta Scott King, who was right on the war question before Martin, she actually led him. And she spoke three weeks after his death and said this. I was looking among the notes in my husband's pockets when he was shot, and I saw parts of a speech which he never delivered. Perhaps they were his early thoughts for the message he was going to give to you today. And then she said, I quote, these are Martin's Ten Commandments on Vietnam. One, thou shalt not believe in military victory. Two, thou shalt not believe in a political victory. Three, thou shalt not believe that they, the Vietnamese, love us. Four, thou shalt not believe that the, the government has the support of the people. Five, thou shalt not believe that the majority of South Vietnamese look upon the Viet Cong as terrorists. Six, thou shalt not believe the figures of killed enemies or killed Americans. Seven, thou shalt not believe that the generals know best. Eight, thou shalt not believe that the enemy's victory means communism. Nine, thou shalt not believe that the world supports the United States. And 10, thou shalt not kill. These, <laughs> these are Martin Luther King's 10 commandments on Vietnam, Coretta said. It was on April 4th, 1967, she said, that my husband gave his major address against the war in Vietnam. On April 4th, 1968, he was assassinated, actually one year later. She says, I remember how he agonized over the grave misunderstanding which took place as a result of his position on the Vietnam War. Coretta and Martin tried to warn America, along with other groups. They tried to warn America, but instead, politicians, civil rights organizations, labor, even preachers, said they were wrong, but history has proven that they were right. We lost that war. We didn't lose it because the media held back our troops or because politicians didn't allow the generals to use all their potential power. 
We lost because the Vietnamese were fighting for something they believed in, while all on our side, however brave, our individual soldiers were fighting as foreign invaders on somebody else's land, and it was an unwinnable war. Today, the daughters and the sons of many of our core supporters of the New Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, are in the military still. Today, we don't have a legal draft, and we hear a lot about an all-volunteer military, except it isn't really voluntary at all. It's made up through a poverty draft. A no other job draft, a no money for college draft, and sometimes even a no other way to get my family health care draft. So these days, the disproportionality of the military isn't by race, it's by poverty and by the rural and urban divide. The military is disproportionately made up of poor young people, men and women, disproportionate from rural areas and small towns. And one effect of that is that, that most journalists writing or broadcasting in the mainstream national press don't even know. Don't even know really those are in the military because they come from the places outside of normally where the media reports. So they don't know how to talk about it. And very often they just don't. All we hear is thank you for your service. And that's a huge problem because today, like in 1968, the United States is again fighting a still brutal, still unwinnable war. And this time is almost 18 years old, the longest war in our nation's history is in Afghanistan. At the moment, the number of troops is significantly smaller than at the height of the U.S. and U.S.-backed occupation that saw more than 200,000 troops in place at one time. But there are still thousands of U.S. troops fighting, killing, and sometimes dying, though rarely these days, in that faraway war. U.S. political and military leaders during the Bush, Obama, and today's Trump administration from both political parties and all parts of government have repeatedly told us they have said there is no military solution. They say it is for Iraq and Syria and Libya and other countries too, and nonetheless continue to send troops and special forces, bombers, armed drones, and more. Their militarized actions giving the lie to their realistic words. What was true in 1968 and what remains an ancient truth today is the understanding that any nation, any nation, we are not an exception. Any nation that lives by the sword will ultimately die by the sword. And what was similar to those of the first Poor People's Campaign in 1968 remains a powerful understanding today is that militarism was then as it is today continually an evil reality that has held the center of our nation hostage since the founding of this country. <laughs> ours, ours is a country, and there's no joy in saying it, founded on two evils, realities. The genocide of indigenous populations who had lived in this land since time immoral, immemorial, <clears throat> and the enslavement <clears throat> of Africans brought to this country in change. Both of these, these, those realities were enabled by superior military power. Guns that won out over arrows. Whips and chains and nooses that won out over stolen lives. And both of those realities provided this country with the land and the water that had once belonged to others and with the value of the labor of people forced to work for the enrichment of others. Those realities made this country, or at least the elites within it, richer and more powerful than any other country in history. And not to tell this truth is to live the American lie. <clears throat> and to ever be bound by its distortions. It is not enough, it is never enough to just remember the evils of our past, however. For we know from our great teacher, Howard Zinn, that there are two narratives in our country and that we need to keep them both simultaneously in our minds and hearts. The first is the painful reality that genocide and slavery are central to our country's history. 
But there's always a second narrative, always a second remnant, rem, remnant, and that is the crucial reality that our country has also been a country of powerful people's movement rising up against slavery and genocide with moral dissent and moral vision and moral resistance. And so if we are serious about changing the present, we need to understand how that past came to be and how the legacies, both the legacies of genocide and slavery and the legacies of the movement against those evil remain with us today and why we must make sure that that legacy of resistance remains. Militarism has been a part of our nation from its founding. The myth of manifest destiny gave religious cover to what sometimes only slightly more honestly identified as what was slightly more honestly identified as Westford expansion. It was the doctrine of discovery that I just recently was talking about with the Apache Nation, whose necklace I was given just a week or so ago. Then it stated that any land not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited by Christian rulers and declared that the Catholic faith and the Christian religion should be exalted and be everywhere increased and spread, that the health of souls be cared for and the barbarous nations be overthrown and brought to the faith itself. This doctrine of discovery became the basis of all European claims in the Americas, as well as the foundation for the United States Western expansion. In the U.S. Supreme Court, in 1823 case, Johnson versus McIntosh, Chief Justice John Marshall opinion in the unanimous decision held that the principle of discovery gave European nations an absolute right to new worlds and new lands. In essence, American Indians had only the right of occupancy, which could be abolished, that meant white European settlers using military force as they moved westward to seize the land across the continent, could establish networks of forts and militarized community where native communities once thrived killing all those who stood in their way. Whole communities, entire nations were forced off their land on, on long treks. The Trail of Tears, where thousands, tens of thousands died. And that's why last week in our Arizona meeting with the Apaches and the Cherokee and the Pueblos and the Navajo people, they've asked one thing of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, that one day when we're here in D.C. on Monday, if we would get a copy of the do doctrine of discovery of origin and burn it, send the ashes to Pope Francis and ask him to denounce it and be the kind of man we know he is. Because from the beginning of this country, from the earliest wars, the Indian wars, racism was the key to U.S. wars and militarism. Wars were fought by us, the white European colonizers, against them, the other, who were demonized as less than human, as barbarians, as savages. The multifaceted democracies of the, of, of the various Indian confederacies were ignored indigenous people's complex integration of humanity with the rest of the living environment was dismissed. Manifest destiny of a continent-wide co co uh, country required the extermination, or at least the removal and concentration of na native populations outside of most of the lands they had inhabited for centuries, for millennia. The racism toward native people was not simply hatred of a people who were different than the European, it was key to legitimizing genocidal wars among ordinary self-described so-called God-fearing people. In June 1864, Civil War hero Colonel John M. Shivington led a Colorado militia against Black Cattle Band of Cheyenne and Arapaho, the encamped at Sand Creek. The PBS special, Who is the Savage, described how some regular army officers protested that to attack the peaceable village would betray the army's pledge of safety. Shivington ignored them and said, damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. He said, kill and scalp all, big and little, nits make lice. He ordered the attack and he also not only was a colonel, but at that time a Methodist minister. We have to know this history in order to be exercised from this history. 
Everything was militarized. The environment became a weapon as millions of buffalo were slaughtered so that native tribes on the plains whose culture had indeed very survival was bound up with the survival of the buffalo died of hunger or were forced off their land. Diseases common to Europeans but genocidal to the indigenous people were used as germ, germ warfare, early weapons of mass destruction. Millions of native people died. In 1763, Lord Jeffrey Amherst proposed sending smallpox infected blankets to native tribes around the same time he called for measures to be taken as would bring about the total expir expir expiration of those Indian nations. Amherst is still the namesake of a lovely uh, town in Massachusetts. Recently, I visited the Apache Nation in Arizona, and I heard how the Apaches were forced onto a reservation down in the river basin. They, had, they were people who lived in the hills. They were forced down in the river basin. And then the army at night opened the river, flooded the river basin, agents of the government in an attempt to wipe them out. And the people still suffer, the children still suffer with tra psychic trauma even today. So the use of military force, militarism became not just an occasional necessity, or an instrument of self-defense, but key to the ideological basis for legitimizing United States power. United States settlers came from Europe for a host of reasons. Some were fleeing religious persecution. Others came in search of for land and profit, a colonial enterprise. For some, it was both. Some came to do good, they said, and they did right well. And militarism, though, was the big part of making that possible. And what this history shows us is still the case that the effort to legitimize the U.S. role as a global superpower, to justify the constantly expanding search for oil and gas, for coal tin for our cell phones, and for access around the world for new military bases, for the expansion of U.S. military and economic power, has been rooted in racism and militarism throughout the history of this country. And it still remains key. And like so many things in our country, good and bad, the impact of militarism does not affect everyone equally. First Nations, the indigenous nations who once populated this land were almost wiped out in the Indian wars of the first 200 years of what would become the United States. Those who survived were legally forced on the reservation, small and inhospitable plots of land mostly incapable of supporting healthy community. Their cultures, political system, religious practices, systems of education, economic life were all shattered. Those who survived kept the legacies of life and movements to reclaim and rebuild those cultures and society were rebuilt beginning in the 20th century, but barely. Powerful movements for land and water rights, for protection of Mother Earth, for national culture, economic and social rights. And yet, today, they still live under military treaties. Yet today, militarism continues to affect Native American communities, with military bases encroaching on Native lands, with weapons testings, including nuclear testings, carried out dangerously close to Native lands. A Washington State University study showed that the huge expansion of military bases in the 20th century was concentrated in the same area as Indian reservation meaning Native Americans face disproportionate exposure to military dangers. The study said the world wars and the Cold War pushed the United States to produce tests and deploy weapons of unprecedented toxicity, and Native Americans have been left exposed to the dangers of this toxicity. And that is why we must continue to have moral dissent, moral vision, and moral resistance until we exercise this demon of militarism from our national body. For African Americans, the legacy of militarism goes all the way back to the first enslaved African Americans brought to the United States in the Middle Passage. The Second Amendment's reference to state militias is, is mostly based on slave states demanding to preserve slave patrols. It was not about guns, it was about slave masters having guns to put down slave revolts, and now the Second Amendment that was put there to make sure the slave masters had guns to kill black folk is now being used to keep guns in the hands of everybody that's killing all of us. 
It was through war and militarism that the institution of slavery was struggled over and the Civil War waged. And even the wealthy slave holding aristocrats made rules to send poor whites in the South to fight their fight while their wealthy sons stayed home. And the Union Army only embraced black soldiers when they were losing and then only in segregated and unfair ways. Notably, Lincoln, who sat on a pew in this church, cites both North and South as the recipients of this horrible penny, the war. Slavery was not simply the South's sin. Lincoln said it was America's sin. And the price America paid, said Lincoln, was just fine. He said, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it, will, that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, <clears throat> and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. America also watched between 1870, after the Civil War, but between 1870 and the 1900s, when Africa faced European imperialist aggression and, 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 and colonization and conquest. African societies tried to resist, but many, many were overrun. And by the early 20th century, much of Africa, except Ethiopia, Liberia, had been colonized by European powers, and America watched. The European imperialists pushed into Africa was motivated by three main factors, one scholar says, economic, political, and social. And Rodney Watley wrote a powerful book. He was assassinated in the 1980s, but he wrote a powerful book entitled How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. So you cannot understand the world in which we live in without understanding the demon of militarism. And in the 21st century, militarism continues to have a particular impact on black communities. Militarism and war abroad has been matched by the militarization of U.S. police in communities across the country. For the last 50 years when America has gone to war or bombed people, it has been against black and brown countries, period. The militarization of U.S. police, including programs through which the Pentagon donates leftover military equipment to local law enforcement, that was how we saw the horror of armed personnel carriers patrolling the streets of Ferguson's black community after the police killing of Michael Brown. And we know that young black men are nine times more likely to be killed by the police than other people in this country. And police killing rates for Native Americans and Latinos are also disproportionately high. And yet we are giving the police departments more military firepower now than ever before. The other day, President Trump touted militarism in his speech in Dallas at the NRA. And he brought up the history of the Battle of Gonzales, which actually has an impact historically, Graylin, on both black and Latino people. He said that that battle traces back to the beginning of the Texas Resolution. Did you all hear him the other day? And he noted that the flag that they put up in the face of the Mexican army in Mexican territory was come and take it. But what he didn't teach the nation, what he didn't say, was the reason the settlers took their stand in Gonzales. It was because the white settlers in Mexico at that time, that was Mexico, it wasn't Texas, they wanted to keep their slaves. And they wanted to remove Texas from Mexico because Mexico had outlawed slavery in 1829 and it was still legal in the U.S. Stephen F. Austin made it clear in 1824, the principal product that will elevate us from poverty is cotton, and we cannot do this without the slave. So Latino communities continue to suffer from the escalating militarism of the U.S. border because in reality, 
Our Mexican brothers and sisters did not cross the border, the border crossed them and took from them what was there in the first place. And it was rooted in the desire to hold slaves. And now, training border patrol agencies in military tactics guarantees more casualties at the border. Even before we get to the latest horror of the White House call for border states to deploy National Guard troops in the border regions. Poor white communities, poor white communities also suffer from militarism because they end up remain the largest source of drafted by poverty recruits to the supposedly volunteer military. Garrett, a scholar from the Vet Voice Foundation, described how he dropped out of high school after his father died of Agent Orange related cancer and ended up working small minimum wage jobs. He says, I bounced around a lot until I decided to join the military one month before September 11th. I was getting in trouble with the law enforcement. I realized that I didn't have a lot of opportunities to go to college. I thought serving in the military, I would get that opportunity. Recruiters, he said, are in our high schools, sometimes in our junior high schools, in our middle schools, recruiting kids all the time. He said, you see them at the fairs. This is someone white. You see them at the fairs and other things where we see eight and 10 year olds being allowed to pick up weapons at a table and hold them and cock them and feel proud holding them. That's what military looks, militarism looks like. That's what the poverty draft looks like. And of course, a country grounded in militarism goes to war. Westward expansion in the United States didn't stop when it hit the California coast. It kept moving west across the ocean. And U.S. colonial moves in places like Hawaii and Guam and the Philippines and far beyond were the result. The wars the United States is fighting around the world today are not making us safer. They are fought for the same things that earlier wars were fought for. Resources, military bases, and the expansion of power. And they still don't keep our children safe. Our young people, mainly our poor young people, are drafted by poverty and the lack of other opportunities into a military to fight wars that cannot be won. And that means that they are drafted into wars where they are fighting and killing other poor people just like them, just like us halfway around the world. In 2009, already eight years into the war, the U.S. military admitted that there were only about 100 Al-Qaeda fighters left in Afghanistan and another 300 in Pakistan. And that was the same year President Obama decided on a troop surge in Afghanistan, adding almost 50,000 more U.S. troops. The situation is worse than ever for Afghans now and for the 15,000 plus U.S. troops still serving there, plus thousands more privately paid military contractors. There is still no chance of a real victory because no one knows what victory might look like. What we do know is that the number of civilians killed in Afghanistan continues to climb. Thousands have been killed. Children, old folks, whole families sometimes. U.S. airstrikes have hit wedding parties where whole communities fall victims to our bomb. Does killing thousands of Afghans make us safer? No, but this is what U.S. militarism looks like. And what we know is that the commitment to militarism and the continuing wars has completely distorted our economy. So our country, the wealthiest country in history, is the only developed country, that's an interesting term considering the way we keep going to war, but the only developed country that does not provide health care to all of its people. Our country. In our country, the wealthiest country in the world, women are more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than in any other developed country, more than 10 times likely than in Belarus and, or Poland. Here in Washington, D.C., in the capital of the wealthiest country in history, the death rate is the highest in the country, and it varies by race, with black women more than three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women. Why? Not because we're a poor country, not because we can't afford health care or first class education or good union jobs and a decent infrastructure for our country, 
but because our economy is first a war economy before it is an uplifting our people economy. Our country, we live in a country in which 53 cents of every discretionary federal dollar goes directly to the military. We might blame our debt on entitlement and welfare, but our debt is really based on all the bombs we have exploded in wars we never should have gone into. And our war economy. 53 cents and only 15 cents to help end poverty. If this president has his way, by 2023, that will be 65 cents, almost two-thirds of every dollar going to the military, and only 12 cents to fight poverty. That's what has to change, and that's why we must have a nonviolent moral direct action, moral vision, moral dissent, and moral resistance. That's why. We, we are not poor. The issue is that never that we don't have the money or that we've got to raise taxes to do right. We don't need more money, we need a different will and a different consciousness. We need to spend the money differently than we're spending it. And we know that if we did spend it differently, our country would be very different. Just a few weeks ago, Trump used 66 Tomahawk cruise missiles made by Raytheon and 19 joint air-to-surface standoff missiles extended range from Lockheed Martin to attack a Syrian air base after a still unproved allegation of chemical weapon use. They cost about 119 million. That doesn't sound like much compared to the over 700 billion Congress just budgeted for military spending. And by the way, on the budget piece, when we have Democrats bragging on a budget deal that they did right by what for the military, and Democrats only bragging that they did right by the middle class, and nobody talking about doing right by the poor, we really have a problem. But $119 million could have made an enormous difference for people at home. It could have paid for 11,000 veterans getting health care in Ohio. It could have paid for decent pay for 1,400 more, more elementary school teachers in Kentucky. It could have paid for 2,141 good union jobs to build safe water systems in Flint, Michigan. The current annual budget at $668 billion dwarfs the $190 billion allocated for education, jobs, housing, and other basic services and infrastructure combined. Out of every dollar in the federal discretionary spending, that 53 cents goes toward the military. What would make us safer? A dangerous escalation in war across the world or a real war on poverty right here in America for jobs, health care, education. We have to make a moral choice. Around the globe, we see the effects of this intersection between racism and militarism. We can see it in the $3.8 billion of our tax money that the United States sends directly to the Israeli Defense Forces every year. Money that enables the military to continue its violations against Palestinian rights and gives the Netanyahu who continuously talks about war and warmongering more, more strength. And to say this is not to dismiss the Holocaust. It is not to be anti-Semitic. It is not to dismiss the tragic remembrance. And it is not to dismiss legitimate enemies of the world in Israel. But money can never be the basis for ignoring the lives of Palestinian children and ignoring the rights of the Palestinian people. It just can't. Anytime money gets in for war, 
gets in the way of believing and working toward a just and lasting solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that would serve the cause of peace and guarantee a two-state solution and promote peace throughout the Middle East. Anytime money gets in the way of that, then our money is being used in the wrong way. And anytime money is given, that can be exploited and used to serve the interests of more occupation and more destruction. It is wrong. And just as, and so we must understand that. At this moment, protest overwhelmingly Nonviolent, unarmed protests continue in the besieged Gaza Strip. Protests which in the last five weeks have led to 40 people killed and over 5,500 injured. Many seriously, all of those casualties are Palestinian. Not a single Israeli has been injured or killed. And they include children, journalists, women, and more. And whenever money causes us to be silent on any kind of destruction of the human family, then our money is wrong. The war economy has been around a long time, and we know that it's the big arms manufacturers, the military corporation, the war profiteers. They are the ones who are benefiting from the wars, not our people. War and the war economy continue to undermine our dreams, to shred the moral core of our nation. We don't need a war economy to protect the truth because the money doesn't go to the troops. Washington's wars of the last 50 years have had little to do with protecting Americans while profit motives have increased significantly. With private contractors now performing many traditional military roles, there have been almost 10 times as many military contractors per soldier in Afghanistan and Iraq war as there were during the Vietnam War. Many of them are making far more money than underpaid U.S. soldiers. An Army private in combat receives less than $30,000 in 2016. At the top end of the pay scale, the disparities are even more extreme. But in 2016, the CEOs of the top five military contractors earned an average of $19 million a year, more than 90 times the $214,000 earned by a U.S. military general with 20 years of experience, including housing alliance and extra combat pay, and approximately 640 times the amount earned by Army privates in combat. They are making a killing off of killing. And they take dollars for building weapons, tax dollars, and then once they take the tax dollars for building weapons, they sell their stocks on Wall Street. And the stocks jump 20, 30, 40 percent. In fact, the stocks go up when there's talk of war and go down when there's talk of peace. The money goes to the corporations, about a third of it, for huge weapon systems. They don't help troop, they don't keep us safer, but they keep killing people all across the world. Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Niger, somewhere else. That doesn't keep us safe. It's not what makes us strong and influential around the world. It's just killing people, killing and making a killing. U.S. military ventures have caused staggering numbers of civilian deaths in poor countries. According to the United Nations, almost one-third more civilians died in Afghanistan during the first nine months of 2017 than during the same period in 2009 when the camp counting began. Compared to that same period in 2016, there was a 52% increase of civilian deaths from airstrikes in 2017, with women and children compromising 68% of these deaths. And we hear a lot about taking care of our veterans, and we should. You saw one on the screen tonight that's living in a homeless camp. But they are also victims of this war. We hear thank you for our service, or your service over and over again. But when our soldiers come home, we know they have to struggle, struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, struggle with wounds, and they have to struggle to get health care. They come home with grievous injuries, physical, mental, both. And we know the pain of moral injury, the consequences of what our troops are ordered to do in these wars. Perpetual war has also taken a toll on U.S. troops and personnel. In 2012, suicide, listen, claim more military deaths than military action. 
a follow-up study found that in 2014, the risk of suicide was 22% higher among veterans than among U.S. Civil civilian adults. By September 2017, an average of 20 veterans were still dying by suicide every day. That's more than the number of black people that were being hung every day in the, in the early 1900s. Among women in the military, sexual harassment is rampant. A 2012 Department of Veterans Affairs survey indicated that nearly half of female military personnel sent to Af Iraq or Afghanistan had reported being sexually harassed, and nearly 25% said they had been sexually assaulted. Michael McPherson, the executive director of Veterans for Peace, described what happens when you find out that what you've been taught people in foreign lands or about them or people in other places is not true. And when you find out that the same economic or social forces that are impacting your communities, whether it be that you are a black person or a poor person or, or Latino or whatever, are also impacting those other poor communities, he said it is then, and you find out that you really have a lot more in common with them than not, that's when you realize that a lot of the policies that you're helping to underpin with your military are not good for your community, nor good for the people you fight. He said, then you realize that you're not really standing on stable moral ground as a soldier. And McPherson says, and then I do believe that there's something called moral injury. We talk about post-traumatic stress, but people can come back home, and they can come home to moral injury, like that man in the grave. Moral injury. And it's hard to reconcile. And the only way you can reconcile it, says McPherson, is you have to speak up. You have to, if you really want to follow moral paths and be delivered. And you have to fo and follow what you've been taught as a child. He said, you really have no choice. Because unless you speak up and resist, that moral injury will traumatize you and hold you prisons, prisoner. So my friends, the truth is that instead of waging a war on poverty, we're still waging a war on the poor at home and abroad for the financial benefit of a few. It is morally indefensible to profit from perpetual war which is why the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, has said emphatically and clearly, if you're going to address systemic racism and systemic poverty and ecological devastation and the moral, false moral narrative of Christian nationalism, you have to add into those, those interlocking injustices addressing the war economy and militarism. And so, In this campaign, we demand that we have a right to protect our communities from the ravages of war and the weapons of war. We demand an end to military aggression and warmongering. We raise our moral dissent, our moral vision, and our moral resistance. We demand and call it for, to an end any surplus military equipment from being sent to our police forces in our communities. And we need, and we demand that we need to shift money from war and militarism to meeting people's needs. We demand, and we will demand with our moral power that we need to end the longest war of the modern era, the U.S. war in Afghanistan. And we demand that when our people come home from Afghanistan, we need to help them better. We need a better VA. We need to help them with depression and help them prevent suicide. And help them with stress disorder and trauma. And stop walking away from them and having them come home from the battlefields many of them should have never gone to and have to battle for life itself. There is an urgency here. Dr. King said it, it's still true nonviolence or non-existence. Either we have a massive moral reset or we will continue to have massive moral injury leading to more people dying. 
dying in their minds and dying in their bodies from the demons of militarism. Oh yes, we demand a stop to the privatization of the military budget and a reallocation of the resources from the military budget to education, health care, jobs, green infrastructure needs, and strengthening the VA and keeping that system public. And we demand an end to voter suppression that suppresses the votes that suppresses the votes of the very communities sent to war, black people and brown people and poor white people, and allows the money from those who benefit from the profits of war and militarism to have untold influence on elections and who gets elected. We demand an end to voter suppression, and we call on all people of, margin, of moral consciousness to go to the polls and vote like never before in your life. We demand a ban on the proliferation of guns in our community, including semi-automatic weapons. We are tired of the bloodthirst of the NRA that's more interested in protecting guns than it is in protecting children and humans. We demand the demilitarization of our communities on the border and the interior. This includes ending federal programs that send this equipment into these local and state communities. And we demand not only that we, that we bring down the wall at the U.S.-Mexico border, and we surely don't build another wall at the Mexico border. We demand an end to the constant attacks and lies on Latino and Mexican immigrants. And instead of building, talking about building a wall and building war, why don't we build bridges and welcome and, and welcoming and an immigration system that will allow immigrants who have worked in this country and spent money in this country and paid taxes in this country to vote in this country so that we can change this country. Instead of criminalizing people, let's help them raise their families and keep their families together. And we demand an end to tearing up treaties and the constant Islamophobia and homophobia that, that drives so much of the war and military rhetoric and reasoning. We demand a just two-state solution in Israel and Palestine. My brothers and sisters, Jesus found this man in the low place, in the graveyard, because of the hurt and the pain of militarism and the war economy. But Jesus came down, God came down, the divine came down to the low place and took him to higher ground. The business people got mad when their pig business that some scholars say was connected to feeding the military industrial complex ran off the cliff, but the man was saved. The community was saved, and the demon was exercised. Today, moral dissent, moral vision, moral resistance, and a moral agenda is needed once again to break the whole of militarism and war profiteering and to take our nation and our world to higher ground. My son is an environmental physicist in undergrad school, he told me once that those who study the environment will tell you that in geography, in demographics, in biology, there is something known as a snake line. The snake line. And they know that if you get above the snake line, a certain altitude, that snakes can't live because they're cold-blooded creatures. Snakes can only live below the snake line. And so when you're gonna navigate in certain territories, you've gotta get above the snake line. In order for Jesus to get the man broken by militarism, he had to go down to the graveyard. But then he had to pick him up and get him above the snake line. In our world today, 
We must take our nation from the lowlands and the graveyards of warmongering and profiteering which are below the snake line. Greed is below the snake line. Racism is below the snake line. Islamophobia is below the snake line. Homophobia is below the snake line. Militarizing our communities is below the snake line. And we're being called to struggle and fight to take America to higher ground. I don't know about you, but I know there have always been two streams in America. One that wanted to go backwards and one that wants to go forward. Which stream are you in? Because I still believe in higher ground. Higher ground above the snake line where we build schools and not wars. Higher ground where we're more concerned about bread and butter than bombs and destruction. Higher ground, where we're more concerned about a guided conscience than a guided missile. Higher ground, where we're more concerned about saving life and educating children than exploding communities. A higher ground, where we're more concerned about treaties of peace than triggering war. Higher ground, there is higher ground where black and white and red and brown and Jewish and Asian and Muslim can form a beloved community instead of finding more ways to kill and destroy and oppress one another. There is a place above the snake line. It's called higher ground. And we must take this nation from the low grounds and the graveyards of warmongering and war economy and profiteering and, to mil and militarism to higher ground. Is there anybody in America that still believes in higher ground where we save life? Higher ground, higher ground, higher ground. I feel like singing, I'm pressing on the upward way New heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant America. Lord, plant this nation. Lord, plant this world. Lord, plant our Congress. Lord, plant the Senate. Lord, plant our world on higher, 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 higher ground above the state line. A message as he gets his breath. I want you to try to hold in place just one moment, one moment as we come close to the end of our program this evening. And I want to, you know, we have this report that's been put out that's a part of what you heard tonight from Reverend Barber, and, and that has been an audit that has been done of, uh, of what's been going on in this country. And I'm going to invite forward just for a moment while the offering is being taken up, uh, Sister Phyllis Bennis. Y'all know Phyllis. If y'all don't know Phyllis, you need to know Phyllis. Phyllis is a tremendous and bright activist scholar, one that teaches us and leads us. Phyllis, where are you? I'm hiding. Good evening. I have, for the moment, perhaps the worst job in this room, which is to speak after Dr. Reverend William Barber. That's something nobody should ever do. But let me start with just very, for a moment, a quick story, another story about Dr. Martin Luther King. How he came to write 
the speech that is, in my view, and I think the view of many, the most important speech of his career, which was the speech at the Riverside Church, where he first came out publicly against the war in Vietnam. And what happened was he was stuck at an airport. Familiar story. He was stuck at the airport, and a colleague who was traveling with him went to get food and brought it back and saw that he was leafing through a magazine. And it turned out to be the Ramparts magazine with a special photographic essay about the cost of the war in Vietnam for the children of Vietnam. And he put the food down in front of Dr. King and Dr. King pushed the food aside and his friend said, aren't you hungry? Aren't you gonna eat something? And he said, I don't think I could ever eat again until we do something to end this wretched war. And three months later, he came to the Riverside Church in New York City to come out against the war that was ravaging the people of Vietnam and ravaging his own community. And it was from that that the first Poor People's Campaign emerged. And I think we know, we know from what Reverend Barber has told us tonight, and we've known it all along, that the cost of war in this country disproportionately impacts the poorest among us, the people of color among us, the most marginalized among us. But what's very important is that we also recognize again and again that it's not only about the economic cost, it's also about the social cost here and across the globe. Because if it was cheap to kill people in a wedding party in Afghanistan, it still would be wrong. If it was cheap to kill civilians in Iraq, using weapons of mass or other destruction, it would still be wrong. It's not only because we pay the price in money here. It's because people are dying over there. They are poor people. These days they are brown and black people and mostly Muslim. They are us. They are us. And we have to keep in mind the necessity of fighting against militarism every step of the way as we fight against racism, as we fight against poverty, as we fight against environmental degradation. So how do we do that? It has to do with making the struggle against war part of every movement that we fight in. That when we fight in all of our movements, when we fight for jobs and education, for health care, for infrastructure, and people say, we just don't have enough money. Yeah, it's because the money is going to the military. So that is the call, not just of the anti-war movement, that is the call of the movement against racism. That is the call of the movement for environmental justice. That is the call of the movement against homophobia and for LGBT rights. That is the movement against racism in this country. All of our movements need to be talking about the impact of war and militarism in our countries. When we talk about protecting refugees, it means we call for an end to the wars that create refugees all around the world. And when we fight to end police violence, we fight against the reality that military weapons from our wars are coming home to be used against black and brown communities in this country. Why there was such an armored vehicle, an armored personnel carrier in the streets of Ferguson. Why? Because under Pentagon rules, they can give away their leftover goods when they bring them back from Afghanistan. And somebody in the police department in Ferguson said, oh yeah, we'll take one of those APGs, one of those armored personnel carriers. What do we need it for? We don't know, but we'll use it. And sure enough, they used it. They used it. So let me just end with one more quote from Dr. King that I think gives us our nonviolent marching orders tonight. When he said, our only hope today, and it was as true 50 years ago as it is tonight, our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world, declaring our eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism, thank you. We're almost done, but that was uh, Sister Phyllis Bennis, who is from the Institute for Policy Studies, and she's the co-author uh, for the uh, Poor People's Report, The Souls of Poor Folk. And lastly, but not least, 
Matthew Ho, who is from who is a senior fellow for the Center for International Policy and a veteran who resigned from the State Department to protest the war in Afghanistan. Hi, good evening. Uh, I want to, you know what, I'm going to go up here, if it's okay, because I need to put this down. Um, you know, a few years ago I could have done this from memory, but I have a brain injury from the wars that I have to read stuff now. Um, and I want to thank Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign for asking me to speak today about what war does to veterans. But first, I want to thank a few people who I see here tonight, Medea, Ann, Kathy, and Packy, and Mr. Barry, for their continual courageous stance against the wars, against injustice, and against what is happening here in this town nearly every day. So thank you. You all mean a lot to me. All right, so, you know, for many veterans, uh, those of us who have taken part in the killing and, and, and are honest about it, war has made us broken people. We live with afflictions of the mind, the body, and the soul. This has always been the case. And, and for no more complicated reason than this, war is organized murder. The effect of it has been and always will be a very profound and damning effect. Thank you. Even in our good wars, the Civil War, after the war is over, 400 to 500,000 men died of morphine addiction. Contemporary tales talk all the time about the old Civil War vet drinking himself or shooting up or smoking himself to death in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. Our other good war, World War II, 16 million men and women went to war. About 7 million of them saw combat. Of that, 1 million were discharged, over 1 million were discharged at psychiatric casualties during their time in service. And remember, PTSD wasn't recognized by the VA or by the American Psychiatric Association until 1980, until those men were in their 60s or 70s. For my generation, can I get a, a, a thing of water, please? I'm sorry, one of the things also too is I take some meds that makes my mouth dry. Thank you. For my generation, veterans were killing ourselves at rates three to four times higher than our civilian peers. For the youngest among us, veterans in their 20s, they're killing themselves at rates six times higher than their brothers and sisters who are the same age. For combat units that have come home and that we have tracked, we are seeing rates of suicide as high as 14 times what their civilian brothers and sisters are experiencing. And this is true for all generations of veterans that have been to war. World War II veterans are killing themselves at rates four times higher than men their same age who did not go to war. And there should be no doubt about this at all. Because there's been dozens of studies that have been done as early as 1981 that have concluded that there is a very real and clear connection between combat, guilt, and suicide. And it goes back to what happened to us in the beginning. We thought we were going off to be heroes. But what we found was that we were no more than pawns for the weapons companies, the bankers, the politicians, and the generals. And that we were villains to those that we were occupying. We did. We really went off thinking that we were going to be heroes. But war is organized murder, though. 
And so those of us who take up the sword are due to die by it at some point. My own life is wrecked and debilitated by an anger and a rage that I unleash without control on those I love the most. And I have a guilt and a sadness that won't leave me. And that brings me continually to thoughts of ending my own life. But dying by the sword is just not an individual experience for veterans, but also for our society. Because the wars that we conduct overseas are mirrored in the wars we have here at home. And what reason are these wars? Democracy? Freedom? It's capitalism. But we have lies and we have myths that we are told to cover up the killing we do overseas to put and keep in place dictators who will buy our weapons and sell us their resources. And when we come home, we come home to live in an unjust and unequal society with the largest prison complex in the world and a political system that seeks to oppress voting rather than to expand it. My friends, I put 10 years into the Marine Corps. I went to war three times, but I never served. But being here tonight with you all, I feel like I'm now serving. And together, in this moral revival, we can overcome the lies and the greed that direct the killing and the suffering. And we can find justice and love, both here at home and abroad. Thank you very much, and thank you all for what you're doing. And as we prepare to adjourn, we're going to adjourn just like we started, with some song, with a song. So that when we walk out there, we got a song in our hearts, but fire in our spirits. Fire in our spirits to bring about the change that we need. Amen. Amen. I'm going to lay down my sword and shield. Down by. Down by. Down by, down by the riverside, down by, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield, down by, ain't going to study. Salam, shalom. <laughs>